I woke up Monday and I had a word on my mind from the scriptures. And I just couldn't get that thought, that word off of my mind. And that word has really kind of led to about five or six hours of studying the scriptures. And uh, tonight you're going to get to the result of my study. The Apostle Paul said, preach the word. He told young Timothy that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, if you do much searching for preaching today, you'll find a lot of storytelling. But you don't find a lot of people preaching the word. Tonight we're going to do some expository preaching. What expository preaching is basically line upon line, precept upon precept. We're going to look at chapter 5 here in the book of Ephesians, and uh, we'll get to a, a thought in just a few minutes, but uh, uh, I love the scriptures. Amen. And if our life is built on anything but the scriptures, it's just sinking sand. That's right. We have no foundation. We, we will not be able to withstand in the evil day, and we are living in the evil day. I was thinking uh, today... Uh, Miss Nett and I was out and about a little bit, and and I I never saw when I was growing up people that had service animals or people that had uh, things that they relied on to help them cope. And the reason being is there's more evil today. Uh, the world is saying that which is good is evil, and that which is evil is good, and People do not have a foundation for their life. I can remember a time when even sinners respected the things of God. And we live in a day and age where wickedness abounds and people have no idea who God is or what the church even stands for anymore. And I'm thankful to have a foundation rooted in the scriptures. And so Ephesians chapter number 5 We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now look at verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be at church tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we're not in a hospital tonight, and we're not providentially hindered tonight, or we're not sick tonight. Lord, we're thankful that we can be here, but we're also thankful for the privilege that we have in being able to attend the church. Lord, we're thankful for the Word of God. We are thankful that we do have a foundation that is steadfast and short and anchored within the veil. And Father, we're thankful that uh, we have something that not only breeds hope in our life and faith in our life, but Lord, even when we face very uh, tumultuous things, uh, we may be shaken, but Lord, uh, we will not easily be blown over because of what you've done in our lives. Now, Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. You know what we stand in need of. I pray that you would uh, uh, illuminate our minds and challenge and quicken our hearts. Father, I pray that we'd be able to bring every thought under the submission. And Lord, our minds and our hearts would be rested upon you tonight. The song Brother Clint sang is so evident, so true in our day and age. Lord, we're going at such a fast pace all the time that, Lord, we make little time for you. And I pray for the next uh, few minutes that our minds would not drift, they would not be allowed to wander, but, Lord, our minds would be stayed upon thee. Now, Father, put a hedge about us. Lord, you know the need of every heart tonight. Help us and we'll bless you for it, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus we do pray, amen and amen. Uh, I want you to notice, if you will, in this chapter, some things that Paul deals with. Can I say, first of all, he deals with obedience. 
In verse number 1, we find again that he says, Be ye therefore followers of a man. Is that what that says? Be ye therefore followers of a religious institution. No. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. He's teaching here on obedience. Can I say that children have what we call a childlike faith. They just believe those that are uh, their superiors, their parents, their grandparents, uh, 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 because they have no reason to doubt them. The problem is, as we live longer and live through life, uh, and we are being let down, uh, let down by people at the job, let down by our bosses, let down by schoolmates, let down even by preachers, uh, we become more and more cynical, uh, and we're more, less and less trusting of anything or anybody. Uh, when it comes to the things of God, uh, we're not to put our eyes on man. We're not to put our eyes on uh, institution. We're to put our eyes on the Lord himself. Uh, and we are to follow the Lord as a dear child follows his parents. We had Ella today. Uh, we went to a store, reached out her hand. She put one hand in my hand, one hand in Miss Sinette's hand, and right through the store we went. She didn't have any uh, reservation about following where we were going. Uh, probably because she knew she's coming out of there with something. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, listen, if we follow the Lord, we'll get a blessing that we can't contain, by the way. And we're to do it uh, by walking in love as Christ also hath loved us. Uh, we love him because he first loved us. Uh, we really didn't know what love was till we became a recipient of God's love. Uh, and so we find that Paul is dealing with obedience. Tonight, how obedient are we to the Lord? Uh, you know, if he says it, that settles it. But does that mean that we abide by it? So we're to be obedient. He also deals with the offering. Look in verse number 2 again. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. We know that Jesus said, uh, Greater love hath no man than a man that laid down his life for his friends. Uh, and we know that Jesus laid down his life for us. Uh, he came into this world for one reason, and that was to die. Uh, he offered himself as a sacrifice uh, uh, for our sins. Uh, we could not save ourselves. We could not earn or merit God's favor in ourselves. Uh, but Jesus, through his uh, eternal offering by offering himself for you and I uh, for dying for our sins for shedding his blood for the remission of our sins uh, became the propitiation for our sins uh, there's only one savior there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved uh, and that is through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and he gave himself for us uh, but my dear friends it also says it was a sweet smelling savor unto God all those Old Testament sacrifice, when they would burn those animals on that brazen altar and that scent went up into the air, that was a sweet-smelling savor to God that they were obedient in their offering to Him. And when Jesus died for our sins, it too was a sweet-smelling savor to God. It was so wonderful He's not needed another sacrifice since. And he never will need another sacrifice. Uh, and can I say, he deals with the offering that Christ gave himself for us. And my dear friends, when you realize what Jesus did for you, it is no problem serving him. Right. We see the uh, obedience. We see he deals with an offering. But then he deals with offenses. Uh, things that should never be named among church people. Look what he deals with. Look at verse number 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. I can never say that word. Covet, covetousness. Huh? When you got fat lips and a, and, and a fat tongue and you're hillbilly, that's a hard word. Said, let it not once be named among you as become a saint, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 
Now here he's dealing with some things that should never be associated with people that call themselves Christians. Amen. We live in a day and age where if somebody goes to something that is called a church, then automatically they say they're Christian. Can I say that they were first called Christians in Antioch, not Jerusalem, and they were called Christians because their lives emulated the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, going to a church does not make you a Christian. Uh, being baptized doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, uh, giving an offering doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian uh, is when you, uh, by faith, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, and uh, through faith and repentance and believing on the Lord, you get saved, uh, and then uh, uh, you get in the Bible and you learn how to live, and you live like Jesus lived. That's what makes you a Christian. To be Christian is to be Christ-like. Can I say, uh, more people would come to church if they saw more Christians. But what I find is there are a lot of people that say they're Christian, but yet they're guilty of these things. Hmm? That movie, J.D. Vance's family, he said his grandma was a godly woman, but she cussed a little bit. Well, then she wasn't godly. Right. Hmm? I'll see people post things on social media, and it'll be foul and vile, but then they'll say in their, in their little heading about who they are, they'll say they're Christian. No, you're not. Let's look at these offenses and what they really mean. He said there in verse uh, 3, fornication. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. Right. Can I say that God ordained and instituted the home in marriage? Right. And, uh, and God's the ones that a man should uh, leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Uh, can I say the relationship between husband and wife uh, can I say that God instituted that and its beauty in it is beautiful in its capacity, uh, but outside of that, it's sinful. Amen. Can I say, he said, fornication. Then he said, in all uncleanness. Uh, that doesn't mean people that don't use soap and doesn't take a shower, although, listen, you ought to take a shower and use soap. Amen. If you can't afford soap, I know that uh, uh, Biden economics is killing our economy. If you can't afford soap, let me know. I've probably got an extra bar and I'll help you out, all right? <laughs> Listen, uh, we, we love to fellowship, but we don't want to smell you before we see you. Miss right. Right. Mm? Brittany, uh, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Mm? No, she knows she don't stink because look how close everybody's sitting to her, huh? <laughs> Owen, don't know about you, dude. <laughs> That's not what uncleanness means, although you should be clean. Uh, uncleanness means an unnatural lust. We live in a day and age where people post things about having a fantasy about it with an animal. That's wicked. That's unclean. That's the things that God told Moses to not even think about or have any uh, 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 thing to do with. And people that were guilty of those things, they took them out and stoned them. Yeah. Amen. Mm, should never be named amongst God's people. And also, he mentions uh, that word I can't say, covetousness. I did better that time. Uh, that just means to envy things that are others or being jealousy over jealous over folks that have things and and uh, lust and greed after things that uh, uh, others have that you don't have you know by, the bible says that uh, godliness with contentment is great gain Amen. you ought to be thankful with what god's blessed you with Amen. and by the way lusting after uh, 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 the big house on the hill you don't know all the stress and all the problems comes with that house right. you ought to be thankful you got a house Mm. Mm. He also mentions, mm, verse number four, neither filthiness. Again, I won't get back into the soap and the water. You don't need to be filthy, but he's talking about your mind and your mouth and your heart. Filthiness here means vile in words or actions. You should never be vile in your words or your actions. Matter of fact, another part of the scripture says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Hmm? I've said it for years. If you can't say it inside the house of God, you don't need to say it outside the house of God. There are people who say, well, I, I'll let a little word slip outside of church, but I'd never say that in church. Well, you, you're, you've already condemned yourself. Uh, then he says, nor foolish talking. 
What does that mean? That means ridiculing somebody. Not to ridicule others. Amen. Why? Because you don't want somebody to ridicule you, do you? We're to esteem others better than ourselves. Amen. He mentions jesting there in verse number 4. Jesting means twisting words to make it obscene. Hmm? Did you ever know somebody will say something and people want to twist it make it dirty? That's jesting. Hmm? Then he says, uh, uh, there are number four, which are not convenient. What does that mean? That means it's highly unbecoming. That means it's not coming up to the proper standard. That means lowering yourself to the world's standards. That's not convenient. You know what is convenient? To be godly. That's what we're supposed to be. That's supposed to be the standard, Christ. But doing these things lowers the standards. Just look at people that go to so-called churches nowadays. Their standards are not the Bible standards. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Some of you bow on your head. We ain't even got to the thought yet. I'm just letting you know what the Bible says. And then we find in verse number 5, he says, For this ye know that no whoremonger. Well, it's a whoremonger. I remember back in the day, if you called somebody a whore, you better be ready, you're going to get punched. Now it's just, it's embraced. Hmm? But a whoremonger is somebody who is a sexually delinquent peddler. Somebody that's a solicitor. Somebody in slang terms is a pimp, pimp that solicits somebody out, that traffics somebody out for gain. Another word for whoremonger is whoremaster. This you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who's an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Mentions a whoremonger. Then he mentions an unclean person. There he's referred to somebody who's corrupt. Lord have mercy. Take that to Washington, D.C. Hmm? Uh, I haven't watched any of the convention this week. I haven't been that desperate. Uh, but the excerpts I've seen... Are they living in the same world we're living in? They're talking about how great everything is. And then they're talking about how bad everything is and they can fix it. Well, you're the one that made it bad. Well, he's doing pretty good four years ago before COVID. Uh, anybody remember dollar fifty gas? It's a distant memory, but I remember it. Uh I remember when you get a you you get a whole roll of bologna for what a slice of bologna is today. And speaking of bologna, I understand Michelle Obama was uh, saying she didn't trust rich people, and she's living in a twenty million dollar mansion up there in Martha's Vineyard. Uh where ninety seven percent of people up there are white, and she's ragging on white people. Right. What for white people? She wouldn't be uh, living in a twenty million dollar mansion. But anyway. I digress. That was all for Bob Drake. He likes that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, that's the most spiritual Bob is, was I'm ragging on, on Democrats. You know, he really perks up. Huh? Mm. But I'll rag on Republicans if you want me to, but I, I can't. i got to get to this. huh? They're just as corrupt. Uh, but then he says... A phrase and he ties in two. He says, Nor covetous man who is an idolater. What is a covetous idolater? That is somebody who sets affection and worships something rather than God. He takes the worship that is due God and he worships something else, and it's usually tied to money or wealth. The love of money is the root of all evil. 
And a covetous idolater is somebody who takes things that God is deserving of, glory and honor and worship and adoration, and he applies it to something that is temporary. So we see that Paul deals with offenses. He also deals with obscurity. Look at verse number 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye, in the, uh, are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Obscurity means confusion and deception. He said, don't be a part of all that. Uh, uh, we know the Lord is not the author of confusion. That's why he gave us his word. Uh, it's the devil that uh, uh, brought forth damnable doctrines and heresies to confuse people uh, who have become religious, but they do not know the Lord. Uh, we're not to take part of that. We're not to bid somebody go, uh, Godspeed uh, who is not godly. Uh, right. My dear friends, uh, a lot of people uh, uh, have no problem with the ecumenical movement. I cannot fellowship with somebody who doesn't believe the Bible. Amen. I cannot fellowship with somebody who doesn't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. I cannot fellowship with somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus is the only merit, uh, means for salvation. Uh, I can't fellowship with somebody who believes you can lose your salvation. I can't fellowship with somebody who says you've got to speak in tongues or you've got to be baptized or there's something that needs to be added in order to be saved. I can't fellowship with that. And Paul tells us not to. Don't be caught up in obscurity and deception and confusion. Let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay and stand upon the word of God. Right. He also deals with the occult. Whenever I ever look at these verses and bring them out, I make somebody angry. If you're part of the occult, I'm sorry. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible said, verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Shed the light on it. Tell the truth about it. Don't get caught up in the occult. He goes on to say this, For it is, even, it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. If you got to meet in secret and you got to have secret codes and secret handshakes and secret uh, uh, meeting places and all that, it's unfruitful works of darkness and it's part of the occult. Uh, can I say Jesus did everything out in the open? Uh, uh, can I say that the church is to be well lit? Uh, can I say the word of God is to be expounded on and preached out in the open? Uh, we don't do things in the back room like they do in uh, Chicago politics. Uh, we do everything out in the open. We have no secrets because the Lord uh, uh, ex he expounded his word and told us everything that we should tell others. Huh? He goes on to say there, verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. We were dead in trespasses and sins uh, until we were quickened by the Spirit of God and it was the preaching of the Word of God that enlightened us uh, because the entrance of thy words giveth light unto all that are in the house, my dear friends. Uh, so we find he deals with the occult. And uh, listen, I'm glad I'm in the light. He also deals with being observant. Look at verse 15. He says, See then that ye walk circumspectly. That's the word I woke up with. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says, See then that ye walk circumspectly. Circumspectly simply means having your head on a swivel. Just being aware of your surroundings. Just being observant. Being alert. Peter wrote it this way. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So you ought to keep your head on a swivel, keep watching all around you, uh, because that dirty booger's somewhere, uh, and make sure you're aware of where he's at. Uh, walk circumspectly, cautiously. 
How many of you know we got a garage down there? Got a bus in it. Every time I go down there to get the bus and I open the garage door, I walk circumspectly. Because there's been known for things that slither to show up in there every now and then. And if I ever step on one, I'm going straight to heaven. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Does that make sense? You walk cautiously. Right. I always do, every time. And, 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 you know, when I have to reach up on a shelf, oh, man, I get the woolly boogers going down my spine because I just know one's going to be there. huh? Uh, I turn on all the lights, make a bunch of noise. Uh, uh. Because my friend Brother Ray won't run them out. I know him. Uh, but no, he'll tell me, oh, I found a snake skin. Well, I don't go for three months after I hear that word. huh? Well, can I say we're to walk that way because a sorry, no good, slithering devil could be around the next corner, could be the next step. So we're to walk circumspectly. We're to walk, be, just be observant. Uh, too many Christians got their head buried in the sand. Sure. You don't see what's going on. But then we notice that he deals with mm, obligation. Look at verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are obligated to be filled with the Spirit. We're obligated to assemble and to sing the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in, in our heart to the Lord. Uh, there's nothing like a good song service to uplift your spirit. Uh, we're obligated to do that. We're obligated to give thanks always for all things unto God, good or bad. Uh, give thanks unto God and our Father uh, uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those things we're obligated to do. Now listen. I've been pastoring almost 29 years, soon to be 25 years here at the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Prior to that, I was an associate pastor for four years. One of the most asked questions that I've had in my entire ministry, and, I, and people ask questions all the time. People ask about the end times. People ask about a certain verse or what a certain word means or what a certain thing meant or some. But one of the overwhelming, most asked questions that I'm ever asked is this question. Preacher, how do I know the will of God for my life? Have you ever asked that question yourself? Shouldn't we all know the will of God for our lives? So with that in mind, look at verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And with God's help tonight, that's what I want to preach on. I want to preach on what is the will of God for every believer. If you're here tonight and you're saved by the good grace of God, what we're going to tell you tonight is the will of God for you. It's for every believer, every born-again believer, this is the will of God. This isn't uh, the will of God for the ones that sit on the right side of the church and not the left side. This isn't the will of God just for preachers. This isn't the will of God for just Sunday school teachers. This is the will of God from the Word of God for every believer. Now, most people, Brother Phil, when they ask that question, Brother Doug, I, I, I want to know how I can find out the will of God for my life. Brother Ron, what they're really uh, seeking most of the time, they're, they're looking for a task they can do, a work they can do, some capacity they could serve in, even some title they can have. That will be the will of God for my life. Um, what they're really trying to do is fill something in their life, a void or or they just are excited, they want to do something for God, but they want to make sure they know it's the will of God for their life. 
but they don't know where to look and they really think, Brother Rod, that I'll give them a little one or two word answer and that's going to satisfy that boy. And my dear friends, it's a whole lot more than that. Here's the will of God for every believer. Can I say it is the will of God for every believer to have a godly walk. Right. Every believer is to have a godly walk. A walk that is set apart that unbelievers don't walk, nor can they walk. Amen. Amen. It ought to be so evident that you know God and it's seen in your walk. Yeah. Amen. Look over in chapter number 4. I'm not going to expound on this. A lot of verses I want to read you, but this is what the Bible says. Look at verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. If people are darkened in their heart, they've never been saved, uh, they can't live godly. Right. And we're not to walk like they walk. Uh, we're not to even resemble them. Look what he goes on to say. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, uh, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Do you ever wonder how you can turn on the news and you can hear about this preacher running off with a, a piano player uh, or you can hear about this preacher uh, embezzling a lot of money and hear about Joe Osteen having six hundred thousand dollars in the wall behind a toilet in their church down there. Do you ever wonder how people can do all that? They have a darkened heart. Uh, they are not living a godly walk. Uh, and he's telling us uh, this in these verses. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, but ye have not so learned Christ. That's what he's saying. That's the word of God. That's not me saying it. The word of God said if their life is darkened, uh, if they live a darkened life uh, and they have a dark and walk, if they have a lascivious and greedious mind uh, that does not resemble Christ, it's because uh, they don't know him. Uh, look what it goes on to say in verse 21. Uh, if so be that ye have heard him uh, and have been taught by him as uh, the truth is in Jesus uh, that ye put off uh, concerning the former conversation of the old man, uh, what you was before you got saved, now you have a new man the spirit of God living in you. Uh, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust uh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind uh, and that you put on the new man uh, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness uh, wherefore put away lying uh, speak every man truth with his neighbor uh, for we all mem are, uh, for we are members one of another uh, be ye angry and sin not uh, let not the sun go down upon your wrath uh, neither give place to the devil uh, let him that stole steal no more uh, but rather let him labor uh, working with his hands the things which is good uh, that he may have to give to him that needeth uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth I already told you that uh, but that which is good to the use of edified uh, that it may minister grace unto the hearers uh, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God uh, which ye are sealed uh, unto the day of the, uh, whereby ye are sealed uh, unto the day of redemption uh, let all bitterness uh, and wrath uh, and anger uh, and clamor uh, and evil speaking put, be put away from you with all malice uh, and be a kind one to another, tender hearted, uh, uh, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Uh, there's a difference be some, between somebody that's walking godly and somebody that's not. Uh, can I say... In having a godly walk, we're to walk in love. Verse number 2, and walk in love. Uh, we're to walk in the fear of the Lord. Acts 9, 31. Uh, we're to walk in the Spirit of God. Romans uh, 8, 4. Galatians 5, 16. Galatians 5, 25. Uh, we're to walk in honesty. Uh, Romans 3, 13, 13. First uh, Thessalonians 4, 12. Uh, can I say that uh, in Revelation 21, 8 said, All liars shall find themselves in a lake of fire. Uh, uh, Christians aren't to be liars. 
desires. We're to speak to the truth and speak honestly. Uh, uh, we're to walk in faith. Second uh, Corinthians five seven. Uh, we're to walk in wisdom. Uh, uh, Colossians four five. Uh, we're to walk to please God. First Thessalonians four one. Uh, we're to walk in the light. Uh, First John one seven. Uh, we're to walk as He walked. First John two eleven. Uh, we're to walk in truth. Second John verse four. Uh, Third John verse three and four. Uh, and we're to walk worthy of our vocation and calling. First Thess uh, or chapter four in verse number one uh, 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 of First Thessalonians. Listen, uh, we, my dear friends, are Ephesians four one, and then it's also found in First Thessalonians. Walk worthy of our calling. Listen. We're to have a godly walk. That's the will of God. Amen. Hmm? You should desire a godly walk. You, desi you should desire to be closer to Jesus this week than you were last week. Amen. And you should desire to have Him develop Himself in you and through you. Right. Huh? Hmm. If you don't desire it, you will never have it. Seek and ye shall find. Yep. Ask and ye shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. It is the will of God for every believer to have a godly walk. Hmm? There's some places you shouldn't go. There's some things you shouldn't say. There's some things that should never cross your mind because you've got your mind saturated with Him and His Word. Can I say it's the will of God for every believer to have a godly walk. It is also the will of God for every believer to worship Him. Amen. 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 We are to worship Him. Can I say that God made man in order for man to glorify Him because He chooses to? Amen. Mm. Amen. He gave man a will. Yeah. Mm. Can I say, and it is up to us to choose whether or not we will worship God. But it is the will of God for every believer to worship Him. Can I say we are to worship Him personally in our personal lives? How do we worship Him personally? We worship Him through prayer. We worship Him through reading and studying the Bible. When we read the Bible and study the Bible, seeking Him, you'll find Him on every page, and you'll have a communion with Him like you'll never ever know unless you learn to do that. We're also to worship Him personally by meditating on the Word of God and meditating on good godly singing and meditating on things uh, that honor the Lord. Uh, we are to renew our minds and we renew our minds with godly things. Uh, 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 and we are to, uh, that's part of worshiping. And also having that godly walk is a part of worshiping God. There are things that I'll choose to do because I know it honors God. Uh, and then we are to worship corporately. When we assemble together, we come to worship the Lord. We worship Him in spirit and in truth. Say, preacher, why do we always preach the Bible and teach the Bible? That's the truth part. And we worship Him in spirit by minding the Spirit of God, but also by yielding our spirit to His spirit. And can I say that... Uh, when we come together, and we come together, uh, 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 we are coming to worship the Lord. Now listen, I know that when I'm standing behind the pulpit, I'm the pastor, and I'm expounding on the Word of God. God's giving me a message. I'm expounding on the Word of God, and folks are looking at me. But I'm no more important than anybody else. Listen, we're all fitly framed together. We all make up the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're the foot or you're the ear. You're missing a body part. The body's not whole. The body's hurt. So we come together. And when we come together, it's not about us. It's always about Him. And we come to worship Him. But can I say this? If you don't worship, worship Him personally and privately, you'll never worship Him corporately. Amen. You go and study when David went and got the ark and brought it back to Jerusalem. And you go and study how many offerings he made 
Every six uh, 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 paces he stopped and he offered a sacrifice, which meant he went to, and the way he had to uh, dissect that animal and, and burn it and, and all that, that meant he meant took somewhere between 10 and 14 trips to the altar and then uh, they'd pack up, go another six paces and he'd do it again and do it again. I think 8,800 sacrifices before he got to Jerusalem. Uh, by the time he got to Jerusalem, he danced before the Lord. Uh, can I say he wasn't dancing? to bring a spectacle on himself uh, to make a show for himself uh, kind of like every now and then when God gets to stern around here and brother Phil can't take it and he takes a lap around here and some of you look at him kind of weird uh, Phil's not taking a lap for you to look at him weird uh, he's took all he could take in the pew uh, and uh, uh, he uh, has to get just do something and he takes a lap uh, and that's not because he just showed up and decided to do that uh, that's because he's been praying he's been reading uh, you talk to Kelly the whole dining room table. He can't even eat out on it. Uh, he's got books and everything. He's out there reading and praying and doing uh, uh, seeking the Lord. I, I watch him on visitation. He's singing from door to door and everything. Uh, I'm telling you, he worships uh, privately uh, and when he gets here uh, sometimes he just gets to bubbling over uh, and he can't take it. Uh, and my dear friends uh, the reason some of you never worship corporately and I'm not saying you have to run a lap like Phil or even act like Phil uh, but sometimes time uh, somewhere along the way uh, a hand will go up uh, a head will nod uh, a tear will run down your face uh, a smile will break out on your face uh, some rejoicing will happen in your soul uh, uh, the reason you don't do that corporately is you don't do it privately my dear friends Amen. it's a will of God for every believer yes. to worship him Amen. it's a will of God for every believer to have a godly walk can I say this? It is the will of God for every believer to be a witness. God didn't save you to sit on a church pew. God saved you to tell somebody else so they too could be saved. Uh, Mark 16, 15, uh, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world uh, and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, that's just not for preachers. That's for everybody. If you've been saved, uh, you've got a testimony of salvation. Uh, you've got something to tell. Uh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Uh, I once was blind, but now I see. Uh, I was on my way to hell, but Jesus came by my way. Uh, somebody gave me a gospel tract. Somebody told me about Jesus. Uh, I went to church and heard preaching and realized uh, I needed to be saved. Uh, and I called on the Lord and He saved me. Uh, uh, you don't have to know the whole Bible. All you got to do is know your story uh, and tell somebody else how Jesus changed your life. Uh, Acts 1 8 says this, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, uh, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. You say, Preacher, I just don't know what to say. Well, I, I just try doing this. Just try opening your mouth. Sure. When you take that step to tell somebody about Jesus, the Holy Ghost will take care of the rest. You'll find you'll have lots to say if you just take the initiative. They just want to tell somebody about the Lord. And even if you can't tell them, just give them a track. We got a bunch of them out there. Just give one to somebody. You'll be amazed at how good that makes you feel that you gave the gospel to somebody. But it's the will of God for every believer to witness. Can I say it's the will of God for every believer to work for him? Many of us before we got saved did enough work for the devil. It's the will of God for us to do a work for Jesus. Hmm? I do not work to get saved. I work because I am saved. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are the workmanship of Jesus. We are a product of what He did on Calvary. We would have never got saved had He not. And Jesus saved us unto good works that we would do something for him hmm? James said it this way James 2.14 what doth it profit my brethren though a man say he had faith and not have works uh, and have not works can faith save him if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you stand in a depart in peace and be warmed and filled uh, notwithstanding you give them not those things which they are needful to the body what doth it profit 
Even so faith that it had not works is dead, being alone. Uh, yea, a man may say, yeah, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Uh, you know how people know you're saved? By you showing them, right. not by you telling them. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, I've heard enough TV preachers tell me stuff. Right. Some of the most godly people I ever, I ever knew in my life didn't go to Bible college. Uh, didn't have big ministry didn't have their face on a billboard they were just people that had a godly walk that proved that they knew God hmm? uh, we're to do a work for him then I'll say this lastly it is the will of God for every believer to be committed to wholeness unity Look at verse 21, Ephesians 5. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Every epistle that the Apostle Paul was inspired to pin down to church, he mentioned something similar, to be like-minded or of the same mind, to be of one accord. Why? Because without unity, there's no function. We need to learn to crucify our flesh and to put God first regardless. When we come, we should not come for self-gratification or we shouldn't come to be seen or we shouldn't come for any other reason than this not I but Christ that liveth in me Amen. again we're to esteem others better than ourselves we're to put others before ourselves uh, and we are to come in unity that Jesus Christ will be glorified Amen. that's all that matters because when we come together as one there's no limit to what God will do in our midst but when you got a big part of the crowd going in one direction, you got some going the other direction, you're not one. One man said years ago, a chain is as only as strong as its weakest link. You get a part of the chain not pulled in the right direction, and friends, we got problems. But if we're all pulling in the same direction, there's no telling what God will do. Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 men and one of them was of the devil. Yeah. What could he do with one church totally sold out and unified? Right. Hmm? Good. The known world at that time had heard of Jesus Christ. The Jews tried everything in their power to destroy the early church. And all it did was make them stronger. And everywhere they went, they said, this is that crowd. Amen. James and John were called the sons of thunder. I wonder how much noise we're making in the world. Well, we could be really making an impact if we'd all get on the same page. Now listen. In everything that I've expounded on from chapter 5, in everything that I've mentioned, that it is the will of God for every believer, there are some things that I have not mentioned. Can I say that I did not mention, and nowhere is it mentioned in the Bible, that our feelings are to be caressed. I'm so sick and tired of going to church and having to walk on eggshells because you're afraid of offending somebody's feelings. I better not shake Miss Pam's hand and talk to her too long because Miss Marcy, if I don't get time to go to her, she'll get to pooch mouth. And for the next two weeks, she'll come and say, Well, Doug, don't love me. Well, you just figuring that out? It's been 30 years. You ought to figure that out by now. Uh, I'm so sick and tired that if somebody uh, cuts down a weed on the property and we don't promote them and do a video showing them doing it, they're going to get to pooch mouth. Friend, if that's what you're doing it for, you have your reward. It's called vainglory. 
The Lord don't care about our little feelings. What He cares about is righteousness and holiness. Nowhere did I mention that our feelings are to be caressed. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere did I mention that our flesh is to be promoted or praised. Uh, it's not about our flesh, not about us, not about uh, uh, anything we've done. It's all about what Christ has done through us. Hmm. I, I, I get an argument every now and then. Because you know, coming out the back door, if you thank me for the message, and many of you don't, but those that might thank me for the message... You know, I'm not going to take the compliment. Because it wasn't my message. I told you the Lord woke me up with the word circumspectly. And I started looking at that word, looking at this chapter. And all this came from that. The Lord done all this. It's His message. He's the one that gave me the intellect. He's the one that saved me. He's the one that called me. He's the one that gave me the message. Uh, he's the one that gave me the ability to deliver the message, even though I can't say that one word. Uh, uh, it's all of the Lord. Uh, it's not of me. And somebody say, yeah, but you're the one that the Lord used. I understand that, but you know, a hammer is still just a hammer. A wrench is still a wrench. It takes the carpenter to pick up the hammer and do the work. Uh, and some of us are hard-headed hammers. Uh, but can I say, it's all the Lord that does the work. The Lord isn't, He, he doesn't share His glory with anybody. And no flesh shall be justified in his sight. Right. And nowhere is it mentioned, and nowhere did I mention, that our faculties, our minds, and our ideals are to be appeased. Huh? Somewhere along the line, we got the, the mindset that, well, if we're members of the church, then, then we have a right to tell our ideals, and that we need to be appeased with our ideals. Well, if God said it, that settles it. The rest of it really don't matter. Amen. What does God say? Uh, that's why we don't have a lot of business meetings. We have business meetings when we have business to take care of. We're just going to do what God says. And uh, a lot of people don't like that. They think that uh, uh, they're smarter than other people. Uh, and you might be. But really, our ideals and our intellect and all that what matters is our heart right with the Lord and is our spirit in tune with the Lord because that's all that matters uh, Brother Ron years ago I'll pick on you I think you can handle it years ago no matter what we'd preach on or teach on there was, there was somebody always wanting to rebut in the shadows so I finally just took all the rebutting in the shadows that I could handle in my hillbilly flesh. So I just said, look, when you've prayed over as long as I have, you've studied over as long as I have, and you've spent as much time with the Lord as I had, then you can tell me what to do. Yeah. But if, if, until then, keep your mouth shut. You know? Yeah. Didn't go over too good. He didn't last long. But anyway. Can, uh, you, know, you know? But listen, I'm nobody. I'm not, but I am the pastor. God's the one who called me to be the pastor. And I'm not being a smart aleck. I say that as humbly as I can. I, I, I'm amazed that you all come hear me preach every week. I'm amazed. I sit back and I'm amazed. Well, the truth of the matter is, it's all what God does. It's not up to us. Hmm. Uh, but Clint sang that song. I, I've learned in four decades of preaching nearly four decades of preaching and then I didn't know this early on brother Clint but I've learned let patience have its perfect work I've learned there are times you've got to step up and do something right now but most of the time I've learned if you wait on the Lord he solves all the equation you don't have to really get involved in it just let him handle it huh if we had rushed to judgment, we might have bought that property up there and been in a mess. See how much dirt they brought in? Yeah. <laughs> that thing's going to quake. As soon as it gets wet or dry, that thing's coming down, huh? Yeah, it didn't pack down. That's a mess up there, huh? 
we'd have been involved in all that mess. We'd have never got a phone call. Can I help y'all with something? This Jackie had to take Ivy out. She's going to hate she missed this. Brother Jim's going to shout on this. As soon as we started talking about building, Brother Jim said, we just had to buy this guy out next to us. And I believe Jim said, offer him $2 million. Didn't you say that? You're crazy, Jim. I ain't paying $2 million for that. But he's making a point. It'd be better to buy that than spend money up there and have to do all that. I just told y'all pray about things. That's all I know to do. Well, the guy that owns that came over and met Brother Ray at the new garage down there, complained about the new light we had because it was too bright. He didn't realize it was beaming off your head. Huh? You're still vexed over that, aren't you? I am. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but Ray did mention that we might like to have his property, and he's open to it, Brother Jim. Huh? Let's do it. Let's do it. Not at two million, but let's do it. He said he's sick of Boone County. He's ready to get out of here. Well, well hey, never know. Let patience have its perfect work. Let's let, let's let him get good and sick of Boone County. He might give it to us. Who knows? Amen. Huh? Yeah, put the light back up and one next to it. One you can see from the moon. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm saying, trying to say we've got to be real careful not waiting on God because God has all the answers. Yeah. And our ideals and our notions. Now, God did make it clear that there's you know, much wisdom in, in counsel, in the multitude of counsel. And when we get together and bounce ideals off each other, we can come up with some wonderful thoughts. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. But let's make sure that God's the one who's directing the ship. Right. Sure. Hmm? And let's follow Him. Sure. And it'll all be fine. Huh? Listen, I don't know what it costs, but I don't know what it costs to do anything. But I know God does. And I know He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So let's just wait on God. All I know is nowhere in here did He ask me to, to run the thing. All He did was ask me to follow Him as dear children. Let me ask you a question. Do you know the will of God for your life? We know for sinners it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But tonight we just gave you five fundamental things that is the will of God for every believer. You get those five down, there's no telling what God will manifest to your heart. That is His will for your life. But the challenge is to get those five things down. Tonight, are you a believer? And if you are, are you seeking him to help you fulfill his will for your life? Let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come get a song of invitation. I know I preached a long time. It's because I'm getting ready to go away and be in revival. I had to load you up for the next week. But if you're saved, it ought to concern you to know the will of God for your life. And you ought to seek to please Him because of the great things He's done for you. Namely, the greatest thing is He saved you. He didn't have to save you, but He did. You ought to desire to please Him. They're picking out a song. Folks are coming. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, thank you for the Bible. Lord, without the Bible, we wouldn't know you framed the worlds. Without the Bible, we wouldn't know the way of salvation. Without the Bible, we wouldn't know how we're to live and conduct our being. God, thank you for the Bible. But I do know you said in the Bible, where much is given, much is required. And Lord, you've given us much, so you expect much from us. So help us, Lord, to live the Bible in front of lost people. God, help us to be a light. Help us to shine in this dark world much brighter than that light back there on that garage was shining. Yes, 
Lord, I pray that there would be such a glow from the inside that it would disturb that man in that house next door. And God, I pray that, Lord, you would save folks all around here to your honor and to your glory. God, forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of our short-sightedness. Forgive us of our selfishness. Help us, Lord, realize we were bought with a price and help us to glorify you in our body, in our mind, and in our soul. Bless this invitation. And God, certainly, I don't know anybody's heart. If there's somebody here tonight not saved, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. We know that's your will. God, have your way. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.